Hello, everybody out there. Uh, welcome to this week of Tasting Together. Sorry about the quick technical difficulties. We had uh, we had this scheduled as a as a stream, which requires like software rather than a webcam. So we had to switch the link really quick. But hopefully, everybody makes it over here and still able to enjoy a pilsner with us this week. So. Uh, my name is Pat Fahey, Master Cicerone and Content Director for the Cicerone Certification Program. And as we do or have done most Wednesdays for the last several months, uh, we like to bring people together once a week to talk about some topic from the general canon of beer topics. A lot of times we talk about a specific beer style uh, and do so in sort of a, a lighthearted way give you guys the opportunity to learn a little bit, ask some questions, and hopefully do it with a beer in hand. Um, if you've joined us in the past, thanks for coming back. Last week we did American Porter, which was a lot of fun. Um, if this is your first time here, as I say every time, be sure to throw out questions as we're going. I won't necessarily get to them right away, but try to make sure that I get every question answered before we get to the end of the session. So. Uh, if you have any questions at all about any of the things that we're talking about, please chime in and uh, let me know. So for those of you that are more perennial viewers, you might know that we've reached the end of what's been up on the schedule currently. So we just added uh, several other scheduled sessions through the month of September. And what we have coming up next week, we're going to continue the general theme of, of crushable German beers. We're gonna be talking about Goza. September 16th, we'll be doing sweet stout. Uh, I'll probably be drinking a milk stout. So sweet stout or milk stout, whichever of those you think is easier to find. September 23rd, we're actually taking first week off since we started doing this. Uh, I'm gonna be out judging at GABF that week, which should be interesting and strange. And uh, Neil is going to be doing a big draft system install that week. So we're both out of pocket. We figured we'd, we'd take a pause that week. And then uh, coming back the following week, September 30th, you'll have Neil covering Fest Beer and Nertzen, kind of doing a seasonally themed Oktoberfest-ish session. And then the week after that, I will be back October 7th to do American Barley Wine. So that's what we've got lined up for the next month or so. So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing this week. And I've been slowly pouring over here my Pilsner. Its head has now fallen off, unfortunately. So this week, oh my God, that's good. We are doing German Pils. And I am fortunate, Avery has great friends in great places. And so she actually just got a package from the folks at Bierstadt Lagerhaus out in Denver. And so we have both glassware and slope floor Pilsner kicking around, which I cannot complain about. It's, God, it's a delicious beer. Um, if you haven't let us know already, uh, toss out in the chat what it is that you're sipping on and uh, yeah, let us know. Sorry, I got to top up one more time. I always like to start by talking about glassware and I, because I had the perfect glass for this, um, didn't go with the standard tulip that I usually use. This is a pretty typical glassware shape for Pilsner style glasses though. A lot of times, I mean, you'll see for German pills, especially a wide range of, of different glass shapes that get used by various brands, but a lot of them are footed. So they have like a, a stem or, or if not a stem, at least have some foot to the bottom of them. And a lot of them are very, narrow, either cylindrical like this or have maybe like a slight taper. And one of the reasons why traditional Pilsner glasses are shaped that way is because, you know, when the style originally 
burst onto the beer scene way back when. Um, it was one of the first widely available, really, really pale beers. And that was a, a big differentiating point. That was an exciting element of this beer. Similarly, this beer style sort of came into being around the time that glassware became more affordable for, you know, the common people, let's say. Uh, previously, glassware was very expensive, so it would have been uh, something that was only used by wealthy or royalty, noble, et cetera. Um, but around this time, you had people starting to be able to use glassware in an everyday function, and you also had this really, really beautiful, clear, pale beer. And so the glass shapes that were typically adopted for this were these really narrow glasses that served to emphasize the clarity and the pale color of the beer. Fun facts about Pilsner glassware. Oh man, that is exceptional. Anyways, so uh, talk a little bit about German Pils history. Like a lot of pale styles, particularly pale lager styles, the history of German Pils can be traced pretty directly to the history of the Czech premium pale lager style. Um, also, sometimes people know this as Czech Pils. It's the beer that is typified by Pilsner or Kell. So, uh, I don't want to go super deep into the history of that style. If you want to know more about it, we, I don't remember when it was, but we did do one of these sessions specifically on Czech premium pale lager, I think at the beginning of the summer. So if you're curious about that style, go check that video out. Um, but basically, you know, in the 1840s in the town of Pilsen, this new style of beer was born. Um, produced by the brewery that would one day be called the Pilsner Kell Brewery. Uh, it was really the first widely available, very pale beer. Um, I wasn't checking the ABV. I was checking the, the date code. <laughs> um, it's real fresh. Uh, so first widely available, really pale beer. Um, and it sort of took the beer world by storm. You know, this beer became immensely popular as an export beer throughout continental Europe and drove the evolution of a lot of similar styles. And some of the things that made that beer unique, the pale color was probably the biggest piece, but also had a bit higher bitterness than most beers being brewed in Germany at the time would have. And in part, they were able to accomplish that because the water in Pilsen is very soft, that low mineral content versus the water in Bavaria, which has very high mineral content. Beers brewed with that level of bitterness using water from Bavaria would develop kind of like a harsh soapy quality. Whereas beer brewed to that level of bitterness in Pilsen took on sort of this more soft, rounded, pleasant, bitter quality. So those are, as I look at it, like those are the two really defining traits of the Pilsner style that set it apart from other beers being produced at the time, that pale color and that kind of assertive snappy bitterness. Uh, and so German Pils was just the German take on uh, on that Czech Pilsner style. Like I mentioned, the water in Bavaria, not super well suited to production of those types of beers. Um, these days, you know, we know how to manipulate water chemistry. So brewers in Bavaria these days are making Pilsners just fine, though it does still remain more prominent, more popular outside of that area. Um, so historically, especially in the early days of Pilsner development, a lot of the Pilsner being brewed in Germany was being brewed in Northern Germany. Um, and as is often the case with interpretation of styles, 
they would have been brewing it with the ingredients that they had available to them. The big changes would have been one different water profile. Water in that region of Germany is significantly more mineral rich than the water in Pilsen. And then also different hop varieties, um, leaning more towards like continental German hop varieties. So from, uh, obviously it's impossible to know exactly what those beers would have tasted like, uh, but from what I've read, those early German Pilsners would have been more similar to what we see from Czech Premium Pale Lager today, more similar to uh, like a Pilsner or Kell kind of beer. Today, there's a lot of differentiation between the beers, but when you go back, like I said, uh, Pilsner and Pilsen started in the 1840s. Um, around the 1870s is when you start to started to see a lot of German breweries beginning to market and produce German Pilsners. But it wasn't really until after Second World War that we saw kind of the, the way that German Pilsners were being made and the characteristics that they were shooting for shift. So Today, when you look at German pills, um, at least this is this is my understanding. Uh, when you look at a Czech pills, it still retains a lot of the characteristics that would have been present in that beer when it was originally produced. Uh, you know, some level of diastole is pretty common in that style of beer. A uh, little bit more malt character, a little bit fuller body. Whereas the German pills of the last fifty years or so shifted towards being a bit cleaner. So not really having much in the way of fermentation character by like the 70s, diastole would have been considered inappropriate in a German pills. Um, also moving to a slightly paler color profile. So those are some of the key differences today that, that differentiate the German pill style from the Czech premium pale lager style. And Interestingly, like, well, we do still think of Pilsner as like a relatively bitter style. It should have some snappy bitterness to it. Pilsners being made in Germany have sort of over the last few decades have been dropping down in terms of bitterness. Like we've maybe seen like a seven to 10 IBU drop in terms of the IBUs of the average Pilsner produced in Germany over the last maybe 20 to 30 years, which, you know, going from an average of like 35 IBUs to an average of 25 IBUs, that's a significant difference at, at that point. And that probably is in part sort of playing to consumer tastes and the popularity of the international pale lager style, which is significantly less bitter than uh, traditional German pills would be. And also, like I mentioned, well, we think of Pilsner as sort of this quintessential German beer. Um, it still sees a fair amount of popularity in Bavaria, but it is by no means the most popular style in Bavaria, which is sort of the central beer region of Germany. Uh, in Bavaria, Helles and Weiss beer command larger market share than Pilsner, but Pilsner very much dominates uh, like northern Germany. Let's talk a little bit about the recipe for a Pilsner. This is a really straightforward section. It won't take me very long to go through because Pilsner, like a lot of German beers, has a pretty simple recipe. Um, you know, I, I don't want to make sweeping generalizations, but when you stack like traditional German brewing up against like American brewing, German brewing is typically very like straightforward by the book trying to produce beers that are very clean, very precise and exacting in their characteristics. And so oftentimes it's less about having like a complicated ingredient list and more about really highly refined technique used to work with your ingredients to produce a phenomenal beer at the end. When we look at the malt that's used for German pills. It's usually just, as has been thrown in the chat, 100% Pilsner malt. Um, looking for something that's going to be super pale, super simple, not much beyond that. 
for hopping. Like I said earlier, we're looking at sort of traditional noble German varietals. Um, probably the most common would be like Hollertauer, uh, Tetanang, and Spalt uh, make up the majority of hop additions for traditional German pilsners. And outside of that, uh, for fermentation, you've got German lager yeast. That's all there is to it. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the water chemistry is a little bit different. Uh, the water is usually a little bit more mineral rich. In particular, you usually, usually have higher levels of sulfate in the water used to produce German pills than you would in the water used to produce like a Czech premium pale lager. And the result of that is going to be two things primarily. Sulfate, one sort of gives you a, a sharper, crisper quality to the bitterness. But then also higher levels of sulfate and yeast will metabolize some of that sulfate to produce uh, some sulfur compounds like hydrogen sulfide, which smells kind of eggy, or sulfur dioxide, which has sort of a fresh struck match aroma to it. So you'll sometimes see those characteristics appear in, in German pills, whereas you're less likely to see them appear at as particularly at, at similar levels in something like a Czech premium pale lager. So when I look at the flavor profile of, of a German Pils, and I'll talk about this one specifically. From a malt perspective, you know, I would say, I, I actually, I don't want to say malt plays a secondary role. I would say in a good Pilsner, like the, the malt characteristics and the hop characteristics are very much in balance. Um, and it creates kind of a, a seamless experience throughout, you know, the consumption of the beer. So on the malt front, uh, in this beer, I get like a lot of sort of crackery, water cracker kind of notes, maybe a little bit of white bread, but, you know, just kind of pale malt flavors are, are what you'd expect. And like I said, it's, it's definitely not the forefront. It just is kind of in the mix alongside uh, hop flavor and aroma as well. So a lot of traditional German hop varieties give you flavors sort of in the realm of like floral, perfumey, peppery, minty. Those, those sorts of descriptors are pretty common for hops like Hollertau and Tetanang and Spalt. Um, this beer is maybe a little bit hoppier than some some German pilsners. That's, that's one thing that I think generally happens in the U.S. compared to in Germany. Um, a lot of traditional German pils, while they will have pretty assertive bitterness, won't have actually that much hop flavor and aroma to them. Maybe a little bit. Some Some will even have a moderate amount, but usually in the U.S., even with people like Bierstadt that produce beer in a very traditional way. It, you know, it's the U.S. We, we hop things a little bit more highly than people do in other places. So this one has a little bit more hop flavor and aroma to it than I might expect to find in a, in a Pilsner made in Germany. Um, and features sort of those classic German noble hop characteristics. It has like a light light spearmint, light, uh, light floral character to the, the hop aroma. Outside of that, you know, the main characteristics that you're looking for or looking at in a, in a Pilsner come down to elements of the taste and mouthfeel. Um, bitterness on this is pretty assertive. There's very little sweetness on the palate and the bitterness is prominent. One thing that I often will teach people when I'm kind of just, when I'm teaching newer tasters in a class, and so excuse me if you already know this, but uh, if you don't, it's a useful tip. Um, the way that hot bitterness works on the palate is it doesn't hit with maximal impact right away. A lot of tastes will kind of like 
you'll perceive the taste very strongly when it's in your mouth and then when you swallow then it begins to fade away with and, and that's the case with some bitter compounds as well but with hot bitterness what usually happens is you have the beer in your mouth you swallow and the bitterness actually grows over the next 15 to 30 seconds and so if you're trying to do close assessment of of the bitterness of a beer what i always tell people to do is like take a sip of the beer move it around your mouth for five to ten seconds swallow and then wait and pay attention to what happens in that like 15 to 30 second window after you swallowed because that's where you're going to notice the bitterness of the beer peak that's where you're going to be best able to to isolate and really identify the level of bitterness that's present in the beer and with this beer like take a sip swallow and after like 15 seconds it's still very it, it has grown to a very assertive level of bitterness at that point um and that's i would say a, a key feature of a of a traditional german pills outside of that body is going to be pretty light carbonation probably medium maybe medium high um I would, yeah, I would put the carbonation on this beer somewhere between medium and medium high. And it probably, that carbonation probably comes through even a little bit more just because the beer is so light, the body is so light on it. So all in all, and one of the reasons why I wanted to do this beer kind of at the close of summer is because not to, not to fall back on my standard terminology, but like a good German pills is just a solid crusher of a beer like this is a beer that you can drink in quantity and that's the case with a lot of traditional german styles i mean if you look at the way that beer is usually consumed in in germany it's often by the half liter and usually you don't have just one um, so alcohol is not super high but very refreshing very drinkable i I love German pills. It's one, this is people give me a hard time on here. Cause I'm like, I really love this style. German pills is absolutely one of my favorite styles of beer. Um, hands down. Like if I had to pick five styles for my, my desert Island fridge, German pills is definitely a lock for one of them. So one thing I wanted to do, and this is something that I'm going to try and add whenever I cover styles going forward, because it oftentimes people have a lot of questions about this, is a style comparison section. Talk about other similar styles, how they're similar, how they're different. So God damn it's good. Um, first one I want to talk about is Czech premium pale lager. You know oftentimes referred to as Czech Pilsner, typified by Pilsner or Kell. These two styles get compared a lot. And like I mentioned at the, at the outset, my understanding is that when German Pils originally came into being, they were very similar beers. At this point, they have diverged pretty significantly. Um, if you look at them side by side, German Pils is virtually always going to be paler in color. Uh, other really big differences. Um, attenuation level is pretty drastically different between the two of them. So Czech pills or Czech premium pale lager is usually on the lower end of attenuation, meaning that it's going to be a little bit fuller in terms of its body. It's going to have a little bit more residual sweetness. German pills, on the other hand, is usually on the high end of, of the attenuation scale. So very dry, very little residual sugar and a bit lighter in body. Um, because of that difference in body and difference in levels of residual sweetness, even though they often have similar IBU levels, German pilses are usually going to be a little bit crisper or more assertive in their bitterness just because there's, there are less things in the beer, beer there to balance that bitterness out to, to soften it. So usually a little bit more of a perceived bitterness in German pills. Uh, I talked earlier about water. You're more likely to see a little bit of like a mineral character to a German pills than you would be to see in a, in a Czech premium pale lager. Then the other big difference is that 
potential presence of diastole. Pilsner Raquel has a spec for the level of diastole that it's supposed to have. Um, that beer always has some diastole to it. In the context of that beer, I think it's fine and I enjoy it, even though I really don't like diastole in most other cases. Uh, in a German pills, totally unacceptable. Um, that would be a, a definite flaw in this style of beer. So those are, those are two, that's, you know, when I sit down and if I have to do a blind tasting between these two styles, the first thing I look for is, is diastole because if the beer doesn't have diastole, that doesn't necessarily tell you that it is a German pills. There are Czech premium pale lagers that don't have diastole to them, but if it does have diastole, it's definitely not German pills. So, and I see a thing about attenuation. Yeah, I, I could probably do a long se session on attenuation. I'll maybe do a few minutes on it in, when we get to the questions in just a little bit. So, um, the other related style that I want to talk about isn't technically like a, a defined style, but it is a style name that gets thrown around sometimes. And so I wanted to, to bring it up because there's not a lot of information out there that defines it. And that's an Italian Pilsner. Um, and Italian Pilsner is, like I said, it's not really well-defined, but most people consider it just to be kind of like a, an extremely dry German pills that's dry hopped. And when you trace that style of beer back, it all sort of stems from this one beer, Tipo Pills, from Beer Ficio Italiano. Um, you know, if you look at Pivo Pills from Firestone Walker, that is wildly successful dry hopped Pilsner style beer. Uh, Matt Brendelson cites Tipo Pills as sort of his prime inspiration for making that beer. So we've seen, when you see people producing these really like hop aromatic forward Pilsners, they won't always be labeled as an Italian Pils, but when people say the name Italian Pils, that's usually the general idea that they're referring to. So not something that shows up in the BJCP, not something that would show up on a Cicerone exam, at least not right now, because we tend to pull from the styles that the BJCP uses. But if you see the term out there, that's what it means. It's just a, it's a dry hopped and super dry uh, Pilsner and is a really, really delightful kind of beer, I would say. So last thing I want to talk about before I dig into questions is German Pils pairing. And like a lot of the styles that I've talked about that are really drinkable um, or crushable or quaffable, however you want to, however you want to take it. Um, beers that fall into that category generally work really well in a wide variety of different pairing settings because usually they're a little bit lighter in, in character, so they can match with more delicate food items. But because they're so drinkable and thirst quenching, they can also work as just an accompaniment to heavier food items. And German Pils, I think, is especially good at that because it does have a pretty significant level of carbonation to it, as I'm like experiencing right now. Um, and also it, it has like a pretty pronounced level of bitterness, which is going to help it sort of handle heftier flavors that you might throw at it. So uh, when I think of like pairing it up against uh, meatier dishes that have a bit of higher fat content to them, the bitterness and the carbonation can serve really well to cut through those things. Um, on the flip side, put it with something del delicate like vegetable preparations or salads can work in a lot of different contexts. And if you did have it in, in one of those context and the Pilsner was a bit too much for the beer, what I would usually, or sorry, the Pilsner was a bit too much for the food. Um, 
what I would do in that case is add a little bit of fat to the dish to give the Pilsner something to cut through, whether you do that with a sauce or just olive oil or some sort of cheese, like adding those sorts of things to a light dish will help to soften the bitterness and the cutting power of the Pilsner and can help line up a, a better match. Um, Bitterness tends to work really well with salty foods. So uh, like prosciutto would, would be really lovely with a beer like this um, or any salt cured ham or salt cured anything. Uh, seafood tends to work really well, like oysters, lobster roll, uh, crab cakes, any of those things. Curries, tacos, like there's a reason why this beer is so widely popular and it's not just because you can put it up against virtually any dish, but like it works in so many different contexts. Uh, if there was a style of beer that I like always try to keep around at home, it's German pills, um, plain and simple. I love this style of beer, so cheers. Let's see. So Shana sent me some questions. She said that there were questions about German pills versus Czech premium pale lager. So I'm glad I already covered that. Uh, she said people also ask about comparing those to Munich Hellas, which is worth bringing up. Um, so Munich Hellas is sort of Bavaria's answer to to the German pills. The style was developed, uh, you know, Neil did a Neil did a session on Munich Hellas recently. So I'd imagine he talked about when it was developed. And if you want to get more in depth on it, you can check out his video on Munich Hellas. But just briefly, it's sort of like a just like a multi pale beer. Bavaria in general produces more malt forward beers rather than beers that have much in the way of of hop bitterness. And I was reading before this session, I, I want to say Pilsner accounts for like one quarter of the beer consumed in Bavaria and like three quarters of the beer consumed in Northern Germany. So huge disparity there. A lot more Weiss beer, a lot more Hellas drank in, in Bavaria. You're talking about the differences. Uh, the biggest difference is going to be the bitterness and hop flavor and aroma. Hellas usually will not have much in the way of hop flavor and aroma at all. Um, and bitterness is usually moderate at best, somewhere between low and moderate. Um, as a result of that, the malt flavors come a little bit more to the forefront in, in a Munich Hellas. Uh, and additionally, they're certainly not lowly attenuated. Um, but they may not be quite as highly attenuated as, as a German pills. They tend to have a little bit more body to them than a German pills would. So big differences there are, like I said, bitterness and, and hop character primarily. Chris Connors asks, apart from simply just drinking it super fast, which you can do because it's pills and it's crushable, any tips for preventing skunking in relatively intense sun? Uh, so I, I, our, our founder, Ray Daniels, who is a man of many lovely hats, has been known in the past to sometimes like put his hat over his beer if he's like sitting on the patio in the sun. Um, outside of like, blocking the light from getting to the beer, uh, at, like by staying in the shade or by covering the beer up with like a hat or something else. Like, no, there, you know, if the beer is exposed to light, it's going to get light struck. And honestly, even drinking it fast, unless you're just like slamming it, like it will start to, a beer like this exposed to like, daylight will start to develop light struck character in less than a minute. Um, I definitely have had experiences where it's like, like sat down with a beer and like 
before I even brought it to my nose the first time, it's like, oh yeah, it like got light struck as I like walked from inside to where I was sitting outside. So, so yeah, if you are highly averse to that aroma, like stay in the shade. Or uh, I always tell people when I do trainings on this flavor, um, 3MBT, that compound that is responsible for light struck aroma is one that we acclimate to very readily. So if you have a beer that's light struck, just like, just like take a really deep sniff of it. And usually that'll be enough to kind of uh, adapt you to it to the point where it won't bother you as much going forward. Um, you may still perceive it a little bit, but certainly less so. So those are my tips and tricks as it comes to light struck beer. Tom asked, how do you identify diastole in beer? So diastole as a flavor compound, most common descriptors for diastole are, uh, excuse me, butter and butterscotch. Uh, it, it very much has like a movie theater butter popcorn sort of aroma to it. And actually it is what used to be used to flavor movie theater, like, like popcorn butter. So um, that buttery note is kind of the, the most common way that people will identify diastole when it's present in a beer. Outside of that, it also does tend to give the mouthfeel of the beer a little bit of a slick quality to it. So I know some people that either have like very high aroma threshold for it or, or are outright anosmic to diastole, which just means that at normal concentrations, like at a concentration where I would smell it, it'd be like, whoa, butter, like they don't smell it at all. Um, and that just has to do with their own personal biology. Uh, I know of people who are who cannot smell diastole, but are able to identify it when it's present just based on the mouthfeel. So uh, that is another way that some people identify it. I'm pretty sensitive to the aroma. So I, I usually know that it has diastole in it before it ever makes it into my mouth. So I, I at least in my experience, I haven't found the mouthfeel differences to be that pronounced, but I, I know that that is a tell for some people on that flavor. And I haven't seen any other questions come in, so I will, I'll talk about attenuation for, for a little bit. And if people have other questions, throw them up now. Otherwise, just enjoy your Pilsner and, and the rest of your day. Um, but to talk about attenuation a little bit. so. Attenuation refers to the amount of sugar that yeast consumes during fermentation. Uh, and it's a, it's a lot of people consider it like an advanced topic within discussion of beer, but it's pretty straightforward. I, like I promise you this. So when yeast ferment beer, the attenuation limit is determined by a number of factors. Could be by the way that the beer was mashed, could be by the specific yeast strain itself. But usually the yeast is going to consume somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the uh, of the gravity that's that's present. And the main things that you need to understand about attenuation are what does low attenuation mean for the profile of a beer and what does high attenuation mean for the profile of a beer? So I'm going to just like lay it out really quickly. When you have low attenuation, what that means is that yeast did not consume as much of the sugar during fermentation. So as a result of that, low attenuation leads to higher body and higher residual sugar in the beer, usually some amount of sweetness. Um, when you talk about high attenuation, it's the exact opposite. So high attenuation means yeast consumed a higher amount of the sugar during fermentation, which is going to lead to lower levels of residual sugar, which people would refer to as the beer being dry. Whenever somebody says that beer is dry, this is another thing that sometimes confuses people. If somebody describes a beer as dry, that means it's not sweet. It means it lacks residual sugar. So highly attenuated beers are going to be low in residual sugar, very dry. 
And also as a result of that, they'll be usually a little bit lighter in body. And like I said, attenuation limit can be controlled by a number of different factors within the brewer's control. Attenuation level tends to be something that is characteristic of different styles. So certain styles like I think of we heavy, uh, uh, like a strong Scotch ale is one of the examples I always like to use for a very, a beer with very, very low attenuation. Um, body is pretty full on this beer, a lot of residual sweetness present. Um, highly attenuated styles, you know, German pills definitely would fall into that camp. Kolsch is another lager style that's very highly attenuated, so very dry, very little residual sugar. Um, when you get into beers that are fermented with yeasts like Britannomyces, Britannomyces is sometimes referred to as a super attenuator because it can eat sugars that normal yeasts can't. So you look at like a Goose or a Flanders Red Ale, and those beers tend to have even more of their sugar consumed. They're even more highly attenuated. So their body tends to be even lighter, tends to be even less residual sugar present. Ken saying higher attenuation doesn't always mean beer not sweet. Alcohol can come across as sweet. Alcohol, alcohol can have some perceived sweetness to it, but I'd be hard pressed to think of, but I'd be hard pressed to think of a beer that was like really highly attenuated that I would describe as, as sweet. Um, like could have, and I think we've discussed this in other, in, in other sections, but like sweet aromatics to it, like aromas that remind you of sweet things like alcohol can in some cases and like fruity aromas can or aromas of caramel or toffee or vanilla, any of those sorts of things. But highly attenuated beers usually are going to be, like I said, I can't think of an example of a beer that's really highly attenuated that has much in the way of perceivable sweetness to it. Oh man. And so let's see the one question that I came up is one that uh, I might be able to answer. I don't know. So the question was, is something like a Bitburger triple hopped pills, just something for the American market who seems to be biased towards IPA, or is that a style Germans are craving these days? I would say more the former. Um, I think that there's maybe more of a willingness to experiment among, uh, I don't like, I don't want to speak for the German populace at large because I, I haven't spent a ton of time in Germany. Um, but what, I, from what I understand, they're dabbling a little bit more in terms of like some of these more extreme styles or, or in terms of things like, like IPA but Germany has such an established beer culture and people are sort of like steeped in, they, they drink beer in a way that is very different than, than we drink it in, in the U S uh, this isn't true in all cases, but in a lot of cases, like beer in Germany is not something to like obsess over or to like dissect necessarily. It's just like, it's part of the fabric of life. Like, you know, you, like you eat certain things almost every day. Like you drink beer with meals because that's like, you just drink five liters of Hellas a day because you, that's life. So, um, so yeah, I would say those sorts of beers are probably more of a, of a grab for attention among the American uh, the American market rather than something that Germans are like, God, I really want a triple hopped Pilsner. Like, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily where that's coming from. Let's see. Question of what I'm drinking out of Denver. I'm drinking slow pour pills, beer stat lager house. It is delightful and amazing. Um, 
this one's kind of off topic, but I'll take it and then we'll probably wrap things up. This, uh, I don't want to say it's off topic. It's about beer. So, you know, we're talking about beer. Um, Patty was asking about off flavor class. Couldn't place the oxidation flavor failed to pick up on cardboard and asking if there are any tips for picking up that flavor. So that flavor compound trans two non and all tends to be, or also referred to as T2N tends to be really, really active retronasally. Um, a lot of people find that they smell it best through the retronasal pathway, which is when you have the beer in your mouth and it travels back out through your nose. So using retronasal techniques, like one of them, you can take some beer in your mouth, swish it around, swallow, and then like, like breathe out kind of hard through your nose. Um, that's a technique that can be really effective for amplifying any T2N if it is present in the beer. So I'll usually teach people if I'm doing an off flavor class and I have people that are having trouble with their, that flavor, I'll tell them to use that method to, uh, to try to boost the signal. And I think that's about all we've got for today. So thank you guys for hanging out and, and drinking Pilsner. Um, yeah, I I love it. I I was super stoked to to do this session. I've been like waiting all summer to be like, when can I do German pills? So thanks for hanging out while I had one. Any luck? See you guys back next week to talk about Goza. Until then, uh, enjoy a beer. Have a good week. <laughs>